The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. <clears throat> this is Neil Paulimus. I'm here to present uh, today's webinar called Constructing Statistical Tolerance Limits for Non-Normal Data. I want to welcome uh, you all again. Um, you can see on the GoToWebinar control the ability to send us questions. And after I go through about an hour's long presentation on the topic, I will um, try to answer whatever questions that you've, that you've sent. <clears throat> it's a very important topic we're talking about today. It's called Constructing Statistical Tolerance Limits for Non-Normal Data. Now, I remember many years ago when I was an undergraduate in the engineering school at Princeton, uh, Stu Hunter, when he talked about this particular topic, statistical tolerance limits, uh, told us it was a very, very important topic that unfortunately was not as well known or heavily used as it should have been. So um, it's oh, I'm much happier uh, to let you know that today uh, it is quite widely used. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through some examples of constructing statistical tolerance limits with a particular emphasis about what we do when in fact the data don't follow a normal distribution. Now statistical tolerance limits typically start when you take a sample of n observations from some continuous population. For example, you may be a manufacturer of medical devices and uh, concerned about some characteristic of those devices, the diameter, the strength, uh, something like that. So you go in and you take a, a sample of n uh, observations uh, of all, from all the devices that you're creating and uh, based upon that, uh, create an interval that bounds a specified percentage of the population at a given level of confidence. For example, it's very uh, common to go out and create a 95% tolerance limit for 99% of the population. That would be an interval in which we were 95% confident at least uh, all but one out of 100 of uh, the items we uh, are producing uh, would fall. It's particularly helpful when we need to demonstrate compliance with a set of requirements or specification limits, uh, because if we could show that the entire tolerance limit, uh, tolerance interval was within the specification, then we would know with 95% confidence that at least 99% of uh, all the devices we're producing uh, are within that particular interval. Now, I'm going to start with a, a set of data that does have to do with medical devices. I've taken a sample of 100 medical devices and measured their diameters. It turns out that the uh, specification limits for the devices, the spec is 2 plus and minus 0.1. And you can see from this particular histogram uh, that there is a fair amount of variability in the diameter. Um, all the observations I've, I've taken are clearly within the spec. The spec goes 1.9 to 2.1. Uh, you can also see that it's not particularly a normal bell-shaped distribution. Uh, you can see that for this particular set of data, the upper spec is considerably uh, larger than the lower spec. Now, if we could assume that data came from a normal distribution, um, <clears throat> then there's a fairly simple way to get a 95% statistical tolerance interval for 99% of the data. You simply take the sample mean plus and minus a K factor multiplied by the standard deviation. Uh, K, it turns out, depends upon the level of confidence uh, and also the percentage of the population that we wish to bound. Most statistical books, texts, at least uh, engineering and scientific uh, textbooks on statistics do contain tables 
from which you can find the value of k if your data do come from a normal distribution. And um, of course, software like Stat Graphics will compute it uh, from uh, some sort of a approximate uh, formula to get those values of k, which is all well and good if your data come from a normal distribution. What I want to talk about today, though, is a general approach for constructing statistical tolerance limits when, in fact, uh, the data may not come from a normal distribution. In fact, uh, step one, whenever you're constructing statistical tolerance limits, should be to verify uh, that, in fact, if you intend to use that formula uh, involving the k-factor, that the data do come from a normal distribution. And so my step one in my general approach is to take my data, test it for normality. If the normal distribution is tenable, if it's a reasonable model for the data, go ahead, use the formula on the previous slide, calculate your normal tolerance limits, and you'll be done. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if it turns out that data don't come from a normal distribution, then we have to uh, do something else. Step two in my general approach is that if the data do not come from a normal distribution, then what we will do is we will search for a normalizing transformation. Okay. If we can find an acceptable transformation, then we'll calculate normal tolerance limits for the transformed data. Okay, We'll transform the data to a metric in which it's normal find tolerance limits for the transformed data, and then invert those limits. That may or may not work. If it doesn't work, what we'll do is we'll move to step three. We'll try alternative distributions, such as the log normal, extreme value, or Weibull distribution. And there are different formulas, other formulas we can use if, in fact, one of those particular distributions fit well, fits well. Okay. That also may or may not work. If it doesn't work, the transformations don't work, if we can't find an alternative distribution, then we'll move to step four. We'll use a non-parametric approach to calculate the tolerance limits. Okay. And I'm going to take you through this step by step using the data I have on medical devices. Now, as I said, step one will be to test the data for normality. So let's go over to Stack Graphics Centurion. Here you see I've loaded the 100 measurements on the diameter of my medical devices into a data sheet. It's called meddevices.sgd. In order to figure out whether or not that data can reasonably be modeled by a normal distribution, I'll start by going to Describe, Distribution Fitting, Fitting Uncensored Data. The column with the data is called Diameter, so I'll put that in the Data field of the Data Input dialog box. And then I'll see a list of 45 different distributions I can fit to the data. Well, we're going to start today with the normal distribution. If, as I said before in my general approach, if I can use the normal distribution, I will. So I'll tell it, let's start and fit a normal distribution to the data. It'll then give me a choice of tables and graphs. I'm going to ask for an analysis summary tests for normality, a frequency histogram, and a quantile-quantile plot. That will open up for me a window with two tables and two graphs. Okay. Let's uh, first take a look at the histogram. There's a histogram of my 100 measurements on the diameter of my medical devices. Uh, it has superimposed on it a normal distribution with the same mean and standard deviation as the data. Now, I think if you look at that, you can see that that's really not a particularly good fit. Um, the data 
itself has a longer tail to the high side than the low side, where of course the normal distribution is symmetric and has equal tails on both sides. Another important way to look at the data is down here. This is a quantile quantile or QQ plot. The QQ plot starts by taking the data and plotting the observed measurements on the vertical axis. So on the vertical axis, we'll see the data sorted from smallest to largest. It then plots it at equivalent quantiles of the fitted normal distribution. That's basically showing where we would expect the smallest of 100 observations from a normal distribution to fall, the second smallest, the third smallest, all the way up to the largest of the 100 observations. If the normal distribution is appropriate for the data, these points should be fairly close to the straight line. Clearly, it should not show this sort of curvature. This sort of curvature is indicative of a distribution with a shorter lower tail than expected. This data point really should be down here. Likewise, we have a longer upper tail than a normal distribution would suggest. This point here should be back down on the line. So that's a suggestion, at least, that the normal distribution is not good for the data. If you want to do a real test, a statistical test, we can come over here to the pane for tests for normality. Here you see the results of a Shapiro-Wilk test performed on the data. Now, the Shapiro-Wilk test is thought to be the most powerful test under many conditions for the hypothesis that the data comes from a normal distribution. It basically looks at that quantile quantile plot, looks at how close the points are to the straight line, and comes up with a statistic to measure the goodness of fit. Now the p-value in this case is 9.3 e to the minus 7. In other words, 0.00000093. Actually, any value less than 0.05 would be a rejection of the normal distribution at the 5% significance level. So it's quite clear from the Shapiro-Wilk test here that the data do not come from a normal distribution. Now, I do need to mention a couple things about the test for normality. There are several different tests for normality that you need to know about. The Shapiro-Wilk test is the recommended test if you have sample sizes between 3 and 5,000. Now that covers, of course, uh, most practical cases from which you'd want to uh, construct statistical tolerance limits. If you do happen, though, to have a sample of more than 5,000 observations, then the Anderson-Darling test is the recommended test. The reason we need to switch at 5,000 is that the, there is no uh, methodology to get a good p-value for the Shapiro-Wilk test if, in fact, you have more than 5,000 observations. So stack graphics will actually automatically switch uh, in its capability procedures and so forth uh, at 5,000 to a different test. Now, one other point that I need to make, and that is, if your data turn out to be heavily rounded, you know, maybe you've measured your data only to one decimal place, for example, then that rounding is very likely to cause failure of the Shapiro-Wilk or Anderson-Darling test. Not because the data don't come from a normal distribution, but simply because you've rounded it too much. Now, I want to spend a, a minute and talk about this because I've seen in practice a lot of people give up on the normal distribution and try to fit something else when their data really was reasonably normal but unfortunately, they hadn't measured it to enough decimal places. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this data away for a moment, and I'm going to open up 
another data set of some simulated data. It's called SIMX. What I've done in this particular data file is I've gone in and I've generated, using our random number generator, some data from a normal distribution. And the first column called X has the data with about 10 uh, significant digits. In the column X2, I've rounded it off to two decimal places. Okay? Now, um, let's see what happens if we try to run a test for normality on this data set. Let's go to our distribution fitting procedure and start with the data with a lot of significant digits. Okay, let's fit a normal distribution, let's run the test for normality and see what we get. Okay, well here's the data, I should show you what the data looks like. Uh, there it is with its 10 significant figures, uh, fairly symmetric set of data. The Shapiro-Wilk test gives a p-value of 0.44, fine. Again, anything above 0.05, um, you would not reject uh, the normal distribution. Okay. Now, let's switch from X to X2 and see what happens. X2 is the data that was rounded to one decimal place. Well, this is what happens to the histogram. Okay, and you can see, for example, some missing bars in the histogram due to the fact that there are, because of the rounding, you have certain intervals in that histogram where there simply are no data points. Can't be because of the rounding. Look at what happened to the Shapiro-Wilk test. It's now showing a p-value of 0 0.008. That would be a rejection of the hypothesis of normality. Now we know the data itself, the original data, were in fact normally distributed, but unfortunately because of the rounding, the Shapiro-Wilk test is going to reject the hypothesis of normality. Okay, now before we give up on normality, what should we do? Well, what we should do is switch over to a chi-square test which can handle the normality, the, I'm sorry, handle the rounding, okay? In order to do that, the first thing I have to do is I have to go to my histogram. I'm going to go to my histogram because a chi-square test is going to compare the heights of the bars to the height of the curve. I'm going to push the right mouse button, though, and go to pane options and I need to set up my classes so that they correspond to the rounding of the data. I'm going to tell it to give me 11 classes between 1.945 and 2.055. Okay. What that has done, oh, I don't think I did that quite right. Let me do that again. 11 classes, I didn't. Uh, going from 1.945 to 2.055. Okay. I'll know it's correct if I have a bar lined up on every possible value that I've measured. So you see a bar lined up here at 1.98, one at 1.99, one at 2, and so forth. So I set up my histogram with a bar corresponding to every possible measurement I get after I round the data. I then go up to the list of tables and graphs and ask for goodness of fit tests. Now initially that's going to do an Anderson-Darling test and the data fail the Anderson-Darling test too, again because of the rounding. I'm now going to press the right mouse button, though, and go to pane options. And instead of the Anderson-Darling test, I'm going to ask for a chi-square test. I'm also going to be sure to uncheck the box that says use equiprobable classes. If I uncheck the box, 
the chi-squared test will look to the histogram for its classes. And then when I press OK, what you'll see is a table, and there'll be one class in my table for every possible measurement that I've got after I've rounded the data. And you can see now on this chi-square test, the p-value is about 0 0.38. Now that's a legitimate test for normality. I've manipulated the classes so that they match the rounding of the data. And in fact, it shows me, regardless of what the Shapiro-Wilk test said about my data, that in fact, if I take the rounding into account, that data is reasonably normal. Now, I spent a little bit of time on that because I have seen several people in practice try to fit other distributions when the only problem they had with their data was that it was rounded too much. They believed the Shapiro-Wilk test when, in fact, it would have been better to have gone ahead and done a chi-square test. Okay. I just thought that was important because I have seen people get into trouble because of that. Okay, now incidentally we'll be posting these slides on our website when I'm finished so that you'll be able to go back and review uh, what I've done. Okay, well let's go back to the medical device data now. The medical devices, the diameters of the medical devices clearly did not follow a normal distribution. They were not heavily rounded. There were a lot of unique values in that data set. I had enough decimal places, and yet the Shapiro-Wilk test clearly said the data did not come from a normal distribution. Well, if I can't assume normality, step two of my general approach is to now take the data and search for a normalizing transformation for a transformation of the data such that after the transformation, the transformed values themselves do follow a normal distribution. And it is often possible to find a power P, such if you take the data and raise it to that particular power, that the transformed data is in fact normally distributed. Now if I can do that, if I can find such a transformation, then I can go to the transformed metric, take all the transformed data values, fit a normal distribution to them, construct normal tolerance limits for the transformed data, and then invert those limits, take the inverse transformation of the tolerance limits to create limits for the original data. Okay. Now, um, in order to do that, to find the best value of P, we typically use the methods of Box and Cox. They presented a general method by which one can, uh, by minimizing a mean squared error, find the best power transformation for the data. Okay, now let's try that. Let's go to Stack Graphics. Let me load Stack Graphics again, uh, put away my simulated data, and get back my medical devices. There they are. Okay, now the best place to go to find a good power transformation is to the Statlets menu. In version 17, there is a power transformations statlet that will take data like diameter and help you find a good power transformation. Now, what it does if you open up the power transformation is it presents to you a quantile-quantile plot. Now, one nice thing about this quantile-quantile plot is it has uh, confidence intervals for the percentiles superimposed around the line. And you can judge whether or not the data are reasonably modeled by a normal distribution 
judge it visually by looking and seeing whether uh, they're inside the bounds or outside the bounds. Uh, there also, though, is at the top here the Shapiro-Wilk p-value. And this is the original untransformed data. Uh, see, you can see the power is 1. Uh, and clearly, um, the original data is not normal. Now, there's also a slider here by which I can change the power. I can actually try different values of P anywhere from minus 5 to plus 5 to see what it does to the shape of the distribution. If I want to use the Box and Cox procedure, I can hit Optimize. And over the range minus 5 to plus 5, it will find the optimal power. Now, it says in this case that the optimal power is minus 5. Box and Cox push that P all the way down to minus 5. And as you can see, it's still not very normal. Now, the Shapiro-Wilk is 0 0.0001. That's still a very strong rejection of normality. So unfortunately, uh, simply trying to take the data and raise it to the power P in this case is not going to give me a normal distribution. Now, there turns out to be a slightly more complicated transformation that I can use if, in fact, the simple power transformation doesn't work. Okay? The, what I can do is put an add end into my transformation. If raising x to the p power by itself won't give me a normal distribution, sometimes I can take x, add some amount delta, and then raise the result to the power p. Okay? That's called a two parameter power transformation. And we can ask Box and Cox then to optimize both P and delta. Now, you do that in stack graphics if you go to the statlet by checking the box at the top here on the toolbar, optimize add end, and then push optimize. And now you get a much better result. It turns out that if you take the diameters and first add, well, actually subtract 1.78688 and then raise it to the 3 point, minus 3.15 power, then in fact you get transformed data that are well modeled by a normal distribution. You can see on the quantile-quantile plot that the points are within the confidence band. You can see the Shapiro-Wilk p-value is now 0.7576, well above the 0.05 we would need uh, to assume that the normal distribution was reasonable. Okay, so in fact, it looks like I can take the diameters of my medical devices, uh, subtract 1.78688, raise them to the minus 3.15 power, and find myself a set of transformed data that are reasonably normal. Okay, good. Now that I have that, I still need to find my tolerance limits. Well, it turns out that on the Statlets menu, there is a process capability analysis procedure that I can use to do this. I'm going to go to the process capability analysis statlet, put in my diameters, and now down here I'm going to put in my specs. The lower specification limit is 1.9, the upper specification limit is 2.1. When I press OK, it's going to come up initially with a capability plot using the normal distribution. I don't think, however, that it is normal. So I'll go up to the toolbar and in the add end field put minus 1.78688. That was my add in. 
Over here, I can use this slider to set the power. And if I bring it to 3.15, there we go, you now see the result of assuming a normal distribution after the transformation. Now, it's not showing you the transformed data. It's showing you the original data. And it's actually inverted the normal distribution back into the original metric to show you what the implied distribution is. If it's normal in the transformed metric, then in the original metric, it turns out to be a positively skewed distribution. Okay. Now, one other thing I need to do. Right now, I'm seeing a capability plot with equivalent three sigma limits. This is the equivalent of minus three sigma. This is the equivalent of plus three sigma. That's not what I want. What I want is tolerance limits. So if I go back up to the toolbar and ask for tolerance limits, I can ask it for tolerance limits for 99% of the data. Now let me move this up until I can get to 99. There we go. Now I have a capability plot with 95, 99 tolerance limits based on the normal distribution after I've done a transformation. And the statistical tolerance limits now go from 1.953 to 2.085. I'm 95% confident that 99% of my medical devices fall within that range based on using a normal distribution on the transformed data. And you can see over here, by the way, the same Shapiro-Wilk p-value that I had in the other statlet, 0.7576, so that you can see that, in fact, the normal distribution is appropriate. So there we go. That is one way to handle my medical device data. And at that point, I could stop. I found a good transformation of the data. Uh, it passes the test for normality after transformation. I fit the normal distribution. I've inverted the tolerance limits. And I now have the tolerance limits for my medical devices. However, I want to show you the other approach, too. That approach actually works on the medical device data as long as you use the two-parameter transformation. Okay. It won't always work, however. If you can't get a transformation to fit the data, then you have to go to step three. Step three involves finding an alternative distribution. Now, Stat Graphics knows how to calculate statistical tolerance limits. It has formulas for 11 different distributions, including the normal. We know how to compute statistical tolerance limits if the data come from a log normal distribution, a Weibull distribution, a Cauchy, two versions of the exponential, a gamma, Laplace, largest extreme value, Pareto, and smallest extreme value distribution. If, in fact, my data are well fit by one of those distributions, then we can use different formulas, not the x bar plus or minus ks, but different formulas appropriate for those distributions. Now, let's go see if, in fact, we can find a good distribution from that list that fits our medical device data. So let's go back to Stack Graphics. And this time, let's go to Describe, Distribution Fitting, Fitting Uncensored Data. Okay, we're going to put in our diameters. We'll start again with a normal distribution. This time, however, I'm going to ask for a table called Comparison of Alternative Distributions. This is going to run a goodness of fit test on a whole list of distributions and tell me which is the best. 
So when I press OK, one of the outputs I get is this table right here. It lists from best fitting to worst fitting the results of fitting different distributions. Now, there's a couple missing from the list. So I'm going to push my right mouse button, go to pane options. Also ask for the Cauchy and two parameter exponential. Okay. That will actually cover all the distributions for which we have uh, formulas to get statistical tolerance limits. Now you can see that at the top, the best fitting data, I'm oh, sorry, the best fitting distribution for the data is the largest extreme value distribution. They're sorted incidentally according to the log of the likelihood function, the likelihood function being in rough terms the probability related to the probability of getting our particular uh, set of data using a particular distribution. Also of considerable interest is the final column here. The final column here shows an Anderson-Darling statistic. An Anderson-Darling statistic measures the difference between the cumulative distribution function of our data and that of these different distributions. The smaller the value of A squared, the Anderson-Darling statistic, the better the fit. And you can see that the largest extreme value distribution is a clear winner according to the Anderson-Darling statistic. Okay, now at this point, I can go to the histogram, which initially showed me just a normal distribution. Push the right mouse button, go to pane options, I'm sorry, not pane options, go to analysis options, and ask for the largest extreme value distribution as well. And now you see both the normal and the largest extreme value distribution. Well, the largest extreme value distribution, it's the solid line, it's the skewed distribution here, which looks actually remarkably like the implied distribution that I got when I did the power transformation but it is a well-known distributional form, the largest extreme value distribution, which is the best of the distributions for which we have formulas. Now, before I just go ahead and accept the largest extreme value distribution, which did turn out to have the best statistics, I should test its goodness of fit. Now, to test the goodness of fit for something other than a normal distribution. The best test, at least the test that a lot of people feel is the best, and certainly is one of the most popular, is the Anderson-Darling test. Okay? The Anderson-Darling test, as I said, compares the CDF of the data to the CDF of the fitted distribution. Now, one note. If you do use the Anderson-Darling test, be sure you use the modified form of the test. Okay, the Anderson-Darling test, um, a lot of tables and programs give you tests, p-values, that assume you know the parameters. But we don't know the parameters of the largest extreme value distribution. The extreme value distribution incidentally has a mode parameter and a scale parameter. We've estimated those parameters. If you use the standard Anderson-Darling test, you will get a very conservative goodness of fit test. You'll accept the distribution more often than you should. So what Stat Graphics does is it uses what's called a modified form of the Anderson-Darling test, which adjusts the Anderson-Darling statistic and its p-value to account for the fact that we've estimated the parameters of the distribution that we fit. Okay, that's extremely important. Now, to do that in stack graphics, I will go back here 
to my distribution fitting procedure. I will go to the goodness of fit table. I'll click the right mouse button, go to pane options, and make sure I've clicked Anderson Darling A squared, and also make sure I've checked calculate distribution specific p-values. That's the option that makes sure you, you modify the p-values based upon the fact that you estimated the parameters. And you can see the results here. You can see it actually both for the largest extreme value and for the normal distribution. You see the A squared, that's the normal Anderson-Darling test. You see the modified form which actually adjusts A squared based on the sample size. And then you see the p-values for the modified statistics. Now there's an exact p-value for the normal distribution. The Anderson-Darling p-value is not exact. It's simply looking at critical values in a table. The way we read this for the Anderson-Darling is it says greater or equal to 0.1. We don't know exactly what the p-value is. We know it's at least 10%. And since it's at least 10%, we would not reject the largest extreme value distribution at the 10% significance level. Okay, and you can see the note uh, that we're using the modified form. Okay. So, it looks like the largest extreme value distribution fits my data well. Let's go ahead and compute some tolerance limits. Let's go to Statlets, Process Capability Analysis. Put in the diameter, put in my spec limits, 1.9 and 2.1. I don't need those to compute the tolerance limits, but it makes a nice comparison when I get my graph. Okay. Uh, when it first opens up, we have a normal distribution. This list over here, though, allows me to switch to something else. And there it is. There's the largest extreme value distribution. And I say, as I said, it has a mode and a scale. Here's the mode of the distribution. Here's the scale parameter. Oh, and right now it has equivalent three sigma limits. I need to go to tolerance limits and again ask for 95% tolerance limits for 99% of the population. This calculation takes a little longer than just doing a Z, so it'll take me just a moment here to get it up to what I want. There we go. 95, 99 tolerance limits based upon the largest extreme value distribution. I am 95% confident that 99, at least 99% of my medical devices are between 1.952 and 2.065. Here's your Anderson Darling statistic over here, uh, again showing us that it's uh, an acceptable distribution. Okay, so we have two choices now. Uh, we could do a power transformation or we could fit a largest extreme value distribution. Uh, either one of them would be an acceptable way to handle this particular data set. Okay, well, that's the first three steps. Okay, I could use a normal distribution. If the data were normal, I could try transforming the data. If I could find a normalizing transformation, I could try to find a different distribution. Or if all else fails, I could go to step four, there it is, and compute non-parametric tolerance limits. Now, it turns out that there is a procedure by which one can compute tolerance limits without assuming any particular distribution. I don't have to assume normality or transform the data or find a different distribution. 
I can just use the data itself. In particular, I can use what are called the order statistics of the data to compute a tolerance interval. The order statistics are simply the data sorted from smallest to largest. So the first order statistic, usually written X parentheses 1, would be the smallest observation in my data. X sub 2 would be the second smallest and so forth. X sub n would be the largest. To create a non-parametric tolerance interval, you first pick a depth. You pick a value for D. And it's almost always 1. Okay? You then plug D into here. And if you use 1 for D, the tolerance interval turns out to go from x1, your smallest observation, up to xn, your largest observation. So you can take the range covered from your smallest to your largest observation to create your tolerance interval. That sounds great. Only one problem, and it's a big problem. You can only specify one of the things you're interested in. You can specify either the population percentage, like I want about 99% of my population, or the confidence level. I want to be 95% confident, but not both. Okay. So it does have some severe limitations. Actually, you can specify both, but only if you take a very large number of observations. On 100 observations, I can't get a 95-99 interval. I may be able to get a 95-90, but I can't get a 95-99. You'll see that in just a second, because I'm going to go back to Stack Graphics, and I'm going to ask it to construct non-parametric limits. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go to the describe menu to describe numeric data, statistical tolerance limits from observations. This is another place in Stack Graphics that does statistical tolerance limits. You can see how important I think they are. You can put in your diameters. You can put in your specs, 1.9 to 2.1. Okay. On the next dialog box, it'll ask what kind of limits you want. The non-parametric limits are here. I can select non-parametric specified confidence if I want to set the confidence level or I can set non-parametric specified proportion if I want to set the population proportion. Unfortunately, I can't set both. Oh, and incidentally, I haven't mentioned this, but all of our procedures let you do one-sided tolerance bounds as well as two-sided intervals. For example, if I only had a lower spec, I might want to do a lower tolerance bound. What's the smallest uh, I might be? Or I can do an upper tolerance bound if I have only an upper spec. Well, let's see what happens. If I ask for 95% confidence, okay, it's going to compute tolerance limits. They go from 1.956 to 2.053. That's the smallest and the largest observations in my data. It gives me a 95% tolerance limit for 95.3433% of my population. So it clearly covers 95% of my population, but it doesn't cover 99. And there's nothing I can do to be 95% confident about 99% from only 100 observations. 
On the other hand, I can go back to analysis options and ask for 99% of the population. Unfortunately, then I'm going to get 26.4241% confidence about 99% of the population. Turns out that I can't set both, can't get both set the way I want if I only have 100 observations. Well, one, the other thing I promised, the last thing I promised to talk about today was sample size. Suppose I did want to use a non-parametric tolerance limit, and I wanted 95, 99 limits. How many samples do I need? Okay. Turns out that there's a place in Stack Graphics that will tell you that. If you go to the Tools menu to Sample Size Determination, you'll see there is an option for Sample Size Determination Statistical Tolerance Limits. If I go down to this button right here, Check Non-Parametric. I can then pick two-sided limits, pick my level of confidence, pick my population proportion, and when I press OK, it will tell me right here the sample size I would need. It says I need 473 samples, observations, to get a 95-99 tolerance interval based upon the non-parametric approach. So if you really wanted to get non-parametric limits, you could go out and take 473 medical devices, measure them, and then the range from the smallest to the largest observation in your data set would be a 95% tolerance limit for 99% of your devices. Okay. That's the only choice you have, unfortunately, if you have, are doing non-parametric limits. Okay. Now, one more thing I wanted to talk about, that was basically sample size for non-parametric limits. How about sample size when I'm doing a normal distribution or maybe a largest extreme value distribution? What can we tell you about how many observations you need in those cases? Turns out there's a couple approaches for figuring out how many samples I should take to do statistical tolerance limits. The classic approach, the one that's been most studied, is based upon picking some P star bigger than what you're trying to estimate. Let's say you're trying to get 99% of the population. Pick a number like 99.5% of the population. We can tell you how many samples you should take so that you, your tolerance interval won't overestimate the range all the way up to 99.5% more than maybe 20% of the time. In the classic approach, you pick a value P star bigger than P, okay? Tell us how frequently you're willing to let your tolerance interval cover P star rather than P, 20% of the time, 10% of the time, what are you willing? And we'll choose the end that you need. Okay. That's the way it's most frequently done. A way I think's a little bit more straightforward, particularly if you have specification limits, is the following. Let me determine a sample size such that the probability that my entire tolerance interval is within the specs is large. You tell me, for example, you want to do 95% confidence for 99% of your medical devices. 
tell me what distribution you think they follow, and I can tell you how big a sample you need so that, let's say, 90% of the time, your tolerance interval is completely within the spec. So you can be confident that you've collected enough data to be within the spec at least most of the time. Now, to do that, I'm going to give you a sneak peek at something that we've been working on. We have taken our statistical tolerance limit sample size dialog box and made a few modifications to it. And I'll show you how it works. Now, this is not in 17.2. This is uh, under development, but I'm giving you a little sneak peek. Uh, if you want to determine sample size, and you have something, for example, like a largest extreme value distribution, you can do the following. You put in the parameters of the distribution that you're using. If it's normal, this is mean and standard deviation. For the largest extreme value distribution, it's the mode and the scale. You tell us what type of limits you want the confidence level, the population proportion, give us your spec. Let's say 1.9 to 2.1. And then tell us how often you want your tolerance interval to be inside the spec. It's called the inclusion percentage. Now, we can't guarantee you'll be inside the spec but we can tell you how many samples you need to be inside the spec, let's say 90% of the time, or 99% of the time, or whatever. Now to figure it out, what we need to do to figure out your sample size, we need to actually do a real-time Monte Carlo simulation. So uh, here I've told it, uh, give me 10,000 samples. Okay, and tell me what N I would need. And I said you could go all the way up to 30,000. That would be a little silly, but uh, hopefully it won't get that big. It'll tell me what N I need such that my tolerance interval is inside the spec 90% of the time. Okay, and what's going to happen is it'll go through a Monte Carlo analysis and in this case, it says that if you have a largest extreme value distribution with a mode of 2 and a scale of 0 0.015, and if your spec is 1.9 up to 2.1, you need 120 observations in your sample to be sure that your tolerance interval will be completely within the spec 90% of the time. Okay, so you can pick the, obviously, the tolerance interval you want to do and also the inclusion percentage. And we can tell you from 120 observations, you will be with completely within the spec with your tolerance interval 90% of the time. Okay, so um, as I said, that part of what I talked about today is under development. Everything else uh, is in the program you have today. Okay, <clears throat> well that's what I wanted to talk about today. I'm going to, uh, I want to point out just a couple other things. First off, I set some system preferences um, before I recorded my webinar here to be sure that I got the test that I wanted by default. If you're familiar with Stack Graphics Centurion, you know that there is an edit menu. And on the edit menu, there's a selection called preferences. Preferences brings up a big tab dialog box where you can set default values for almost anything in, in the program. The distribution fitting tab lets me set the default test for the normality and you can see I picked Shapiro-Wilk. The default goodness of fit test, I picked Anderson-Darling. And also whether or not by default you want to calculate distribution-specific p-values. Okay. 
Incidentally, you set these once and they stay set until you change them. Right? They'll be the same tomorrow as they are today once I've set them. I've also set on the graphics tab three decimal places for my labels. You know, there was a lot on my graphs to the right of the graph. And I was I had it put three decimal places there by default. Okay. I need to point this out because if you try to replicate what I was doing here, you might by default get different tests unless you made these settings. Okay. Now, as I said before, we're going to post the videos. Uh, this It's not really a video. It's a, uh, well, it is a video. It's a recorded webinar. We're going to post the recorded webinar, the slides and the sample data on our website at stackgraphic.com slash webinars. I also want to recommend to you, if you're interested in tolerance intervals at all, there's a new edition of the book by Jerry Hahn, Bill Meeker, and Luis Escobar called Statistical Intervals, A Guide for Practitioners and Researchers. Actually, the second edition is coming out in February 2017. So you might want to wait a couple months the old edition is good too. I'm sure there's a lot uh, of new uh, up-to-date results in the new edition. So keep that on your wish list. It's a really good book for um, practitioners and researchers, as it says. Okay, now I did get a few questions sent in by um, listeners and I want to uh, quickly go over those. Uh, before I let you go. <clears throat> okay, let's see what the first question was. Dealing with data, it's interesting to understand why some trends are present in the data. How can we interpret the compensating transformation coefficients leading to a normality, speaking of the parameters of the real process underlying the observed process? All right. I think what's the comment here is the fact that often when you see non-normal data, it's not because the population at any given time is non-normal, but because things have been changing over the course of time in which you've collected the data. Right. If you start with a nice normal distribution for your data on Monday, right? uh, but something changes and you take some more data on Tuesday, it may be normal on Monday and normal on Tuesday, but when you combine the two samples, it's no longer normal. Okay. Um, how do I interpret the transformation coefficients? I don't really think there is any real interpretation of those coefficients. You saw that I transformed the data, for example, by raising the data to the minus 3.15 power. That 3.15 doesn't mean anything to me. I don't think it has any real meaning. All we've done is empirically try to find a metric in which the data are approximately normally distributed. Why? So that we can use normal tolerance limits, the results, the x bar plus k times s equation, to get the tolerance limits and then untransform them. At best, what we've come up with is an empirical model for our observed data, right? And at least approximate tolerance limits for the population over the time in which we've collected the data. Okay. It's, it's real empirical modeling. I don't know that there's you know, in general, any real interpretation. Sometimes there might be. I suppose sometimes the transformation might turn out to be a square root. 
and there may be some physical reason why the square roots of the data should be normally distributed even though the original data wasn't. That would be quite particular to the process that was being modeled. Um, so as a subject matter expert, you may see some interpretation that, that I, just as a straight data analyst, am not going to see. Okay. Uh, I see another question here. We use statistical tolerance limits to determine material strength allowables. For example, composite material handbook CMH17. These are statistical tolerance limits, usually 99% coverage at 95% confidence and 90% uh, and coverage at 95% confidence. For these, we usually need to look at things like the effect of lot-to-lot -lot variability along with within lot or additional factors like uh, uh, test temperatures or heat treatment categorical factors. Uh, are there plans to incorporate corporate, <laughs> are there plans to include uh, this type of uh, capability in a future version? Um, okay, I will, um, take a look at the uh, composite materials handbook. I'll see what it talks about and uh, if there's something there that really is uh, going to be useful to a lot of people, I will definitely uh, try to include something like that in a future version. Always good, looking for good ideas by the way. I have a lot of good ideas and a lot of things already uh, under development. Um, I will definitely look at um, at this as a, as an as something to include and um, quite possibly you might see it uh, in the not so distant future thank you for the idea okay <clears throat> another question i understand the stats here but how do you respond to folks who suggest you're doing data mining to find a way to justify not using non-parametric tests for the data um, well, I am certainly uh, doing empirical modeling. There is no doubt that I'm la allowing the data to talk to me. Now, I should, when I show you all of this, these transformations, these selections of distributions and so forth, I'm not suggesting that Every time you take a sample of your medical devices, that you go through this complete process. Because the worst thing you could do is, on Monday, create statistical tolerance limits using a power transformation. On Tuesday, use a normal distribution. On Wednesday, use the largest extreme value distribution. We don't want you taking every single sample you take and looking for the best necessarily procedure for that small sample. What we would prefer you do is when you're setting up the methodology you're going to use to handle and analyze your data, when you're setting up your protocols, take a large sample of data Okay, something large enough to really help you determine what the best procedure is. And I, I often say at least 300 observations, okay? Because it's hard to choose between distributions or between the largest extreme value distribution and the power transformation approach, unless you have at least 300 observations. Take a large sample figure out the best method that you need to use. Okay? And then use that method on a day-to-day -day basis. Write that methodology into your protocol. Decide what distribution models diameters, what power transformation is necessary, for example. Write it into the protocol, and from there on, use that methodology. Really what I'm talking about here is what I would do to develop a protocol for handling my data. 
Okay. What else do we have? Um, when box plot and alternative distribution CPK values differ, how does one choose which method to report? When box plot and alternative CPK values differ. Well, you did notice, I really wasn't talking about the capability indices today, but you did notice as part of the output of our capability analysis procedure, we did come up with CPK values. Now, those are equivalent CPK values. So, for example, those are CPK values based on the transformed data or based on percentiles of the largest extreme value distribution. Whenever we go ahead and fit a distribution, let's see if I can go back here and, and find, for example, the largest extreme value distribution. You can see there it is in the margin, CPKs, defects per million, PPKs, and so forth. Those don't use just the simple formulas for CPK and PPK. What we actually do is determine percentiles of the largest extreme value distribution. And from the distance between the percentiles, well, actually, it's a little more complicated even than that. We find the percentiles, we convert them to z-scores, and based upon the z-scores, come up with estimates of CPK and PPK. We're very careful to make sure that when we give you a CPK and a defects per million, that that will be a consistent relationship. That will be the same relationship as if you assumed a normal distribution. A normal distribution with a CPK of 1.283 gives you 59.651 defects per million, just as in our largest extreme value distribution. We're very careful to maintain the relationship between the CPKs and the DPMs. I'm not sure what the question, what box plot necessarily has to do with, with CPK. I'm a little confused about that part. But thank you for, for making sure I pointed this uh, out on my analysis. Question, why is there no process for setting tolerances for a chi-square distribution? Probably because chi-square is a special case of one of the other distributions. I think chi-square, if I remember right, is a special case of a gamma distribution. Um, if it is, of course, I could easily put it on the list. Chi-square, though, we often use obviously for calculating statistics and p-values when we're doing statistical tests, not so much for modeling data, um, although it is a special case. I believe it's the of the gamma distribution, which in fact uh, we do uh, <clears throat> give tolerance limits for. Okay, well I thank you. We had a very large crowd for this uh, webinar. Uh, larger, perhaps the largest uh, crowd that we've had for all of these webinars, which uh, leads me to believe, in fact, that it is a very interesting topic for a lot of folks out there. So I will uh, take very seriously any suggestions you send to me about additional things you'd like to see in stack graphics for the future, having to do with tolerance limits, capability analysis, uh, and so forth. Uh, oh, one more question. It just handed to me. Could a menu be added for ex to find, for example, a 95% confidence limit for the non-conforming fraction outside a specification? Aha. You would like a confidence limit for the percentile of the distribution. Okay, that sounds like a good idea, too. Uh, because you'd like a confidence limit for some performance index. Okay, that's going to require a little bit of thought. Again, thank you for the suggestions. You can continue to su send suggestions to support at stackgraphics.com or just neil at stackgraphics.com, N-E-I-L. 
if you like, and I'll be happy um, to uh, read them and, and get back to you. Again, thank you for your patience. I'm going to sign off right now and uh, keep the ideas coming. Talk to you soon.